thanks. So I'm hoping this is going to be sort of a relatively gentle and fun talk about a theorem that not that many people know about. And in fact, maybe we'll just start, Alvaro, with the first polling question. I have just two polling questions at the beginning. Um, the first one is just aimed at actually at faculty and postdocs. Um, I want it to be aimed at people who've been around for a while. How many of you have heard of the grand Lignier theorem, whether it be in the chain case or in the wild case, prior to reading the abstract for this talk? Um, my sense is that it's not a well-known theorem, and I think it's sort of elementary enough and pretty enough that it should be. So there's a new proof that I'm going to talk about. It's joint work with Jeremy Ear. By the way, this is a conference, so I should have a name tag, right? Um, okay, great. We're all set. Um, and let's go. Let's talk about this theorem. Um, and whenever you get the results of that, please let me know. So maybe the first thing I will say is a remark. There's a quadratic extension And I'm going to leave a little space here. From a phi at five, of course, we all should know what this is. It's just q root five. But I want to emphasize that it's the, we want we want to study ramification at exactly a list of prompts. Okay. Um, so, for instance, well, maybe I'll ask: Do we have uh, any results on the poll yet, or are we still waiting? The poll is still running, but right now it's 30% uh, no, 2% yes. Okay. So I think that that's the point I wanted to make, especially to the younger people in the audience. This is not that well known theorem. Um, so this is one thing. And what this, this talk is going to be about is. When does there exist a Z mod P extension of a number field K ramified exactly at some set S? Okay, so maybe um, I'll ask the second question now. Uh, the polling question, and that is, does there exist k over q quadratic? So this is for everybody. Ramified exactly. What did I have? I think I had five, seven, and thirteen. Okay, now 5 and 13 are 1 mod 4, so we know that though there are those extensions, just like we have q root 5. But for 7, that is not the case, right? For 7, this discriminant is 28. So then you would say, I'm kind of answering the polling question. Um, here, the discriminant, which measures the ramified primes, is negative 7. But I'm going to say that if you're looking for something ramified just at 7, both of these are failures. Because this is ramified at 2, and this is ramified at infinity. OK? so. There is no quadratic extension ramified exactly at 7. And the same thing happens here for this example. That was a part of the polling question. You would have to look at to get something that's not ramified at 2. And then you would uh, allow ramification at infinity. So I want to reframe this question in a way that's also pretty elementary. And if, if you haven't seen this reframing, it's not too hard to immediately see that it's correct. Uh, go. 
and namely that I'm only doing the quadratic case right now. We'll get to the um, A mod P case in a moment. There exists a K over Q ramified exactly at n primes. So my convention when I use these is I'm going to allow infinity as a prime. So we'll, and uh, when I'm working with the number field K, there could be several different infinite places. Um, so just bear that in mind, that's only relevant when P equals two, when we're doing quadratic extensions. Um, ramified at these, if and only if, This equation holds. Now, I have to talk about what is this sigma sub p of i. This is a Frobenius. So right away, we're kind of understanding a little bit about the Tame case because this extension is ramified in two, so it wouldn't make sense to talk about Frobenius. It's also ramified at infinity, but infinity is a little funny. And what's happening here is the Frobenius in this extension. Uh, sorry, maybe I'll say E. Uh, well, sigma equals trivial. If P is one mod four and non trivial, otherwise, so for P that are three mod four, I should probably move these. Otherwise, so that's P equals three mod four and P uh, infinity, because the infinite prime is non trivial for Venus in this extension even though it ramifies, but we're, those, those things end up being, like I said, a little bit weird. So this is going to be the idea, and this is what we call a governing field. So there's a field that controls this. And, you know, this is sort of very standard. It's Q root N, you know, if N is one mod four, it's ramified exactly at those primes, um, and not in, well, exactly at those primes, but then is positive. And if n is uh, three mod four, you need to do q negative n to allow ramification. <laughs> so this is Grand-Lunier in the very trivial case. Let me state the tame Grand-Lunier theorem. Oh, actually, before I state the tame Grand-Lunier theorem, I want to do just one really dumb and quick exercise that's going to come up later when we prove the theorem for p equal to. So just a quick exercise. Let's see. I'm just choosing primes that are one mod four here. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a field in between these two fields, and that's pretty obviously the square root of the product of the two things, but the fives go away. We don't really need to have them because there's a five squared and that pulls out. So this is fairly obvious. Um, why am I going through this exercise? The, the point is that the outer fields are ramified at five, but the diagonal is not. Okay, and this is very particular to P equal two. If these were Z mod three extensions, there would be two fields in the middle, and controlling the ram and one of them would be unramified at the common prime of ramification. I um, I guess thirteen you can pull this off with. Thirteen is one mod three, uh, but uh, um, you'd have two. You'd, but there'd be only one of them of the two intermediate fields would be unramified. At that common problem. Okay, and when it gets to P, there, there'd be P minus one intermediate fields, and only one would be unwrapped. So things are a little bit different in P equal to versus not P equal to. So maybe that's worth remarking. Bigger than two, 
P equal to 2, there's going to be a dichotomy. Not only in this stuff, but in actually the statement of the theorem. Um, as things stand right now, we sort of generalize Gromigny a little bit, and we, it's a new proof, um, largely came out of the work that Hajir and Mayer May, May, and I are doing on King K. Shaparevich groups and trying to understand them. Um, and uh, we sort of needed Gromigny, and I didn't, I mean, I'm not, the proof is completely correct, but I didn't understand it, and I wanted to think about it in, my, you know, in, a, in a way that made sense to me, and that's sort of what pushed us in this direction. Um, there's going to be a dichotomy, and, um, well, you'll see it. It's kind of, in, I'm still a little confused by it, but it's kind of interesting. Okay, so let me actually state the theorem of Gromigny, and at the end, when I, I'll state the slight generalization of it. It's very much in the spirit of that Q of I business that I just wrote up on the board. Okay, so I'm only working with number of fields. We actually haven't thought about this at all for function fields. I imagine a lot of it carries over um, pretty directly. separately is sort of, you know, half of the battle. 
And here, this object that controls things is some amalgam of the two things. Okay, so we've got that. Um, oh, yeah, lots of another remark I should make. You should be immediately looking at this and saying, well, if I have a prime, it might split in here. In fact, it's going to have to split in here. It's going to turn out that if you want a Z mod P extension, okay, ramified at some prime P1, the norm of P1 has to be 1 mod P. Otherwise, the thing's not going to exist. That's a relatively straightforward exercise in local class field theory. Um, well, yeah, or global, well, whatever, it's not hard. Um, but that means that thing is going to split into many primes here. So what does it mean to talk about its Frobenius in here? There's lots of primes above it, which one? And that's a problem. Until you realize that all of their Frobenii are non-zero scalar multiples of one, or one another. So sigma p i is well defined up to a non-zero scalar multiple. But there is an ambiguity. On the other hand, that does not affect this side. If you scale this by a non-zero multiple, then you're just scaling this non-zero coefficient by a non-zero. So Anyways, it's not hard to find sets where this happens, where the probedii add up to zero. It's not hard to find sets where it doesn't happen. Um, but this is the statement of the theorem. And like I said, it's kind of a nice thing. Um, now, I said in my abstract that there is one element of class field theory that I'm going to need. So I'm going to put that up on the board. I'm going to try and save it. We'll see if I can do that. But once we get that up and a little bit more work, we'll be in shape to do p equals 2 case. Ramanye with a slight generalization attached. Um, so here is the theorem. This is a classical theorem from class field theory. I'm not going to prove it or even talk about where the proof comes from. But it's just basically sort of working through the basic Adele theory of class field theory. And this thing pops out. And that is. So what is GT? It's going to be the Galois group of K ramified only at the primes in T. And the, the action is always going to be trivial on Z mod P, so it's going to give the number of generators of the pro P part of that extension. So what does this equal? This equals 1 minus R1 minus R2 plus delta, plus the sum of B and T of delta C P, plus the dimension of this piece. OK, so we know what 1 is. R1 is the number of real embeddings. K, R2, the complex embeddings. This I just explained and wrote down. It's some weird class group unit thing put together. And these guys, I'm just going to say what they are. This is one if the pth roots of unity are in your field and zero otherwise. This is one if the pth roots of unity are in your completion or zero otherwise. OK, so that's this nice formula. Um, and I do want to make a remark that this applies in the, this is from the tame case only. There's actually, I mean, there, there's a version of it in the wild case. Um, but I should remark that in the Tame case, you do not have global duality theorems to help you out that relate H1 and H2. There is no exact formula for H2 in terms of H1. Um, and that's sort of an open question. And that's part of uh, the ongoing work with Fajir and Maier. It's to understand what's going on uh, in this case. So I now want to do some setup for the, the proof of the theorem. I'm going to need this. I'm going to try and preserve it. Um, and what are we going to do? A little bit more work and we should be almost ready to prove the theorem um, for P equals 2. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, so we're going to have a bunch of primes, S, and we're asking, is there a Zeeman P extension of K? Okay, okay. ramified only and exactly at these places. So we know that now we that there's it's, we can talk about the Frobenii of those guys. So let's let W in that Galois group Now, of course, we're extracting p roots. The p root of unity is already in this field. This is a nice Coomer extension. The Galois group over here is just a bunch of copies of Z mod p. It's a vector space over f p. So it's meaningful to talk about the space span by those Frobenia. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a basis. Associated to R of them. And then there's going to be some others that don't add any to the space. These ones span W. When you start tossing these in, the span is still W, right? You got a vector space, a bunch of vectors. Some of them form a basis, the rest are redundant. Okay, I said there's going to be some linear algebra over FP, and this is where we're going with that. Now, here's the thing. These, this, there's a linear combination of sigma, you can, I can write sigma Q1 as a linear combination of sigma P's. Big deal, you've got a vector, you're writing it as a linear combination of a fixed basis. That's definitely possible. Um, and I can do this with sigma Q2 as well, and all of them. Okay. Now, here's what I want to sort of study. I want to study that equation, and of course, it's for any i, it's not for i equals one, but I'll just write it for one. And I want to ask, what is, let's set S1 equal to Q1 plus, plus this horrible notation, U, the PIs with non zero coefficients. in this linear combination right here. Okay, some of them will have zeros we're not really worried about. What is this? Now this H1 is a hum, so it measures the Z mod P extensions ramified at S1 but not at Q1. So it's, it's measuring the Z mod P extensions ramified at this set. Okay, we're going to toss in all these p's. What happens? Let's look at this equation. We're going to start with p equal the empty set, and we're going to start tossing in these p's. Every time we toss one in, the right side of the equation goes up by one, because that p has an order that's one mod p. But we're killing this guy, the empty set, we're killing the dimension of it, because these guys form a basis of this. So every time we toss one in, this goes down by one. So the right side doesn't change. Okay, so the claim I have is that this is just that. that if there are no more extensions ramified at just these places. But now what happens when you toss Q1 in? Okay. Does not equal. This is properly bigger. Why is it properly bigger? Because when we add toss in this prime, we're adding one in here. But this guy is dependent on these guys, so the space span is the same, so this thing stays the same in size. So we have that this thing is grown by one dimension. So if we add them in one at a time, all the p's first and then q, we realize this is bigger than this, which means there's an extension ramified at q1. 
Now, is it ramified in the rest of the keys? The way I've defined it, it is, because I've only chosen those with non-zero coefficients, and you can reverse this ordering. I don't have to start with the keys and then end with Q1. I can start with any of them and end with any of them, and I get that these things are equal, so I can replace this by any of these guys in, in place of Q1, and I get this the case. So what I get from this argument is a baby Grand Meunier. I'm going to leave this up for just a minute. So we just proved choosing the set. The set is, you know, the, we are choosing it at the beginning. We're sort of choosing a bunch of primes, forming these sets arbitrarily by picking a basis, and then we're getting Gravenier for some specific subsets, but not for every subset of, of our capital S that equals the union of every. So we're not where we want to be yet. And the only thing we used was this class field theory result and this linear algebra. Okay, that's sort of like the claim here, that that's all we're going to use. And now, I think, we are pretty much ready to go for P equals 2. But I want to do one more piece of setup that, that applies in general as well. So let's look at these dependence relations. There's sigma Q1 plus a bunch of the PIs, sigma PIs. Sigma Q2 plus a bunch of the sigma PIs and so on. Well, we can form a matrix out of that by just extracting the coefficients. Here, of course, it's 0 times sigma Q2, 0 times sigma Q3, all the way up to QS. So we can form a matrix that looks like this. The identity component part is going to come from these, and then we just extract these coefficients to form this matrix. Now, I want to form a matrix on the other side with the cohomology. Well, I said these two things aren't equal. That means I have an F1 in here ramified at S1. Now, I probably skipped a step. I, I should apologize. A cohomology class like this, I think I said it's a hom, and a hom cuts out a field extension. So I'm basically jumping back and forth between elements of this, these H1s and Z mod P extensions of my field ramified inside this set. Okay, and then here we have this one and it's ramified exactly. And that's it. Okay, cool. Well, what I can do now is form a matrix and I can evaluate, there's gonna be an F2, an F3, and an FS, just like we had S for each of the sets, we're going to have a cohomology class like that. So let's evaluate these at generators of inertia. Like if we evaluate this at sigma Q2, it's unramified because Q2 isn't in this list. So we're going to evaluate Fi at, I'm going to call those tau's. At these generators of inertia. Because these extensions are ramified. And I'm just going to evaluate all the FIs at these tau's, and I'm going to get a matrix. When I evaluate F1 at tau Q1, I get a 1. And when I evaluate it at the rest, I get a 0. And the same thing with F2 at tau Q1, I get a 0, and so forth. I'm just going to get this matrix. Now, I'm not exactly getting that matrix. I'm going to explain the lack of well-definedness in just a moment. And then over here, I'm just going to get some matrix. That's S by R. Okay. I'm going to erase this stuff now. But here is what we have basically proven. Okay. 
And that is this is the case that if an entry is zero here, it means that that prime did not occur in the corresponding linear combination in the row, which means the corresponding thing will not be ramified here. If it's non-zero here, then in that row, we saw that that prime occurred and remember the order that we added that it didn't matter. So this would be ramified and this would be non-zero. Now, here's the big thing I should remark. Everything in this game is only well defined up to scalar multiples. Those cohomology classes are only well defined up to scalar multiples. The tau qi's are only well defined up to scalar multiples. So technically, I can scale. So this really isn't the identity, but I'm allowed to scale it to make it the identity. But I can sort of scale columns and scale rows, and that sort of causes problems by non-zero multiples, except when you're at p equals two. There's only one non-zero element, and everything is well-defined. Now, by the way, this is important. This statement right here is insensitive to this lack of well-definedness because yeah we do some a bunch of non-zero scalings we're not going to change zero to something not zero or vice versa so this statement is absolutely correct and it, this is well-defined um and at p equals two everything is well-defined and in fact f equals t we're about ready not just to prove well basically to prove Ramonier, but to sort of prove I mean, the generalization in the people's two case isn't that interesting, um, and we'll explain why in a second. But uh, let's hope, let's just prove wrong again in the people's two case. Okay, ready for the proof. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, excellent. I forgot to write something down. the dependence relations, a very trivial exercise that I won't do is these rows form a basis for the set of dependence relations on the Brobedian. I'll leave that as an exercise. It takes about a minute. Okay. Um, and these rows are the FIs at inertia. Now, the first row is a dependence relation, and that's sort of measuring, remember, we had the baby Gromagnier. Now, we want to extend that to the general Gromagnier. Mirror basis over here. Well, that means any dependence relation is a linear combination of these. But a linear combination in characteristic P is just a sum of some number of the rows. Okay, take the corresponding sum. Of the rows of that thing. Actually, maybe not of the rows of that thing. Of the FIs, of the corresponding cohomology classes. Now we're done. What we have is sort of a bijection, really. Um, and what we're going to find is okay, you take this sum, and we ask ourselves this dependence relation. 
This cuts out a field extension. By the way, we're taking a non-trivial linear combination. So we're taking a non-trivial linear combination of independent cohomology classes, so we're getting an extension. So we take the corresponding sum of the FIs, and what do we get? We get sum G. Maybe it's F1 plus F3, I don't know, plus F7. That cuts out a Z mod P extension of K. And where is it going to be ramified? Well, it's going to be ramified at, when we're taking some of the sums of these rows, we look in one column. And we're adding up some of the rows from this column. And that's the evaluation and inertia at this time. Maybe it'll be sigma sum q. Well, if there, if this, if there are an even number of non-zero entries, then they add to zero. If it's an odd number, then they add to one. Right? And maybe I should call it sigma p. That's better. Okay, fine. So well, what's happening over here? Well, we're getting the same combination, so we're going to get a zero or a one, the same on this side as on that side. So we've got our dependence relation, and now we've got a corresponding extension. And what's really happening is when there's an even number of things, it's kind of like that setup with Q and Joy, and I forget what primes I used in the beginning. Maybe it was 5 times 13 and 13 times 17. And then the, there's the question of what's the diagonal for that's 13. There's the question of what's the diagonal field. Well, the diagonal field won't be ramified at any common primes. So you're just sort of doing a bunch of those diagonal field things, and you're killing the ramification when an even number of them occur. You're not when an odd number occur. And that's actually the whole proof when people do. Now, I don't have much time left, so I'm not going to go through the details of the general proof for odd p. Um, but I am going to at least say a few words about it. I think I have like three or four minutes. Um, have I got that right, Alvaro or uh, Jennifer? Um, right. So here's what I will say about the general case. Yeah, Ravi, another another three minutes is good. Perfect. Thank you. So for the general case, I spent we spent some time trying to prove this. I don't believe it's true. Um, that, that the matrices, oh, I'm sorry, we spent some time trying to prove that the matrices are equal. Submatrix of F and the corresponding submatrix of T, their ranks are the same. And by the way, I left this up on the board on purpose. This is the one by one version of this that holds in general. And you can prove this statement, and this is what allows one to prove the theorem. And maybe I'm not going to have time to get into the details of the proof, but what I'll state is what our version of the proof is. It's slightly more general. So the theorem. Is now where did it go? Right. And this is a very annoying theorem. And, and I'll explain why.
So you always on this side have to go up to and ramify elements. That's just the way life works. But the theorem is that these two sets are the same, that the number of different extensions ramified exactly at the set S is the same as the number of de dependent relations with support exactly in S. And the reason I don't like this theorem, the way it's stated, is right now, we don't have a natural bijection between these two things. What we do is we show that this, these are each uh, subsets of vector spaces, vector spaces of dependence relations um, with support contained in S, and then you remove the ones with proper support. Homology classes ramified in S, you remove the ones with proper ramification, and you show that all of these, then there's an inclusion exclusion argument, you show that all of these things have the same size, but you never get a correspondence that's natural. And maybe there isn't one, so maybe I should like the theorem the way it's stated, but maybe there is one and then I shouldn't like it. Let's see. All right, that's a good place to stop. Thank you.